Hello, good afternoon uh, everyone. Welcome at this talk. It's good to see so many persons attending this session. And this talk will be about a container platform we're building for the banking industry. More specifically, we're building a container platform for the AB Nemro Bank, Bank in the Netherlands. Um, who am I? My name is uh, Wiebe de Roos. I'm being hired by AB Nemro as a CICD consultant and engineer. And I'm working at the CUESD software department, and that's the center of expertise of software development. And from within that department, there are several teams helping and supporting all the development teams within the entire um, bank to, to help them with their DevOps journey, with uh, CICD related aspects, um, software quality, standards and guidelines, containerization, and moving applications to <clears throat> different cloud providers. I'm in a centralized team, and the centralized team is completely focused on everything that has to do with um, containers. Also, I do a lot, of, a lot of stuff about container security, and I'm involved in um, all Kubernetes-related aspects. And from that aspect, from that spectrum of um, uh, topics, uh, we are building a container platform. So, what are we going to talk about? Uh, I give a very short introduction about the AB Nemro Bank. We'd like to focus on the technology part, on the container platform part. Um, so that's very important. We're going to talk about the DevOps and container journey. It's a, it's a summary of what we've been through the last couple of years. And then we zoom in into the container platform itself. Uh, it consists of a whole bunch of um, building blocks and briefly explain what the building blocks are doing. Next to it, we have uh, pipelines. It's all related to CI and CD. We're focusing on the CD part, so we will quickly go through a number of those pipelines. Um, it's all about a container platform, and I'm within a bank, and container security is very important. Um, security is top priority everywhere, uh, including containers, including VMs, including applications, and also for standards and guidelines. So we have a lot of slides uh, on how we implement container security within the enterprise. Final section is about um, compliance, more specifically about compliance within the context of this container platform and the way we collaborate with uh, stakeholders, developer teams, and all the other parties that are involved into this um, container platform. So starting with uh, some context about AB Numbro, it's all about skill. It's about a giant skill. Uh, we have like almost 20,000 people working um, at the bank. We're headquartered in Amsterdam. And more importantly, we have more than 400 development teams. So from that perspective, every topic that we address here is taking into account these giant numbers. It's not about 10 teams running some container somewhere that got all of the privileges, uh, our admin everywhere. It's in a controlled environment, but it's very important to think about this skill for whatever decision we take. Next to it, we transformed from a traditional waterfall application towards Agile, Agile Scrum, and now we're heading for the, the, the DevOps way of working, and we're moving applications to the cloud. We have more than 3,000 applications, and um, those are being created by all of the development teams, both onshore in the Netherlands and offshore mainly in, <coughs> in India. So that about the skill and the context of this um, presentation and this organization. Um, the DevSecOps or the DevOps journey, I will happily skip that. We have some other presentations that we gave on other conferences. I can talk about it for quite a while, but it's not so important for uh, us right now. Let us focus on the container platform as a final solution or as a destination for teams to deploy their applications on. So it's all about containers here. Um, if we take into perspective the timelines of containers from 2017 until now, it all started with some very simple 
Docker Pox, proof of concepts, just running some containers on a VM in the on-prem data center, see if you can access it and see if other teams can use yeah, very basic applications um, to see if they can use it and if that is a good base to further enhance um, the, the journey of containers. So what we did is we have Jenkins as a centralized orchestrator for a lot of teams. I think it's about 90% of all those 400 teams are on Jenkins. And in 2018, we moved Jenkins or we copied a, a specific part of Jenkins. We put it in the AWS cloud and it was completely based on containers. And that was, of course, a very long time journey and it involved a lot of investigation, we need to mitigate a lot of risks, we need to talk to a lot of parties to make this happen, because this was one of the first big container use cases. And from that time on, people, our development teams were able to build container images and run their containers and package their applications. So it became very critical that we had a container security solution. I'm heavily involved in that discussion and into the solutions that we build um, for that topic. And we did some proof of concepts with different tools, open source tools, commercial tools. And in the end, we choose for Twistlog as our container security solution. That's now being used in every phase of the uh, software development lifecycle. Then, at the beginning of 2019, we decided we need a container platform to deploy all of those containers. Every team can do it in their own way, be it on a bare VM or in AWS Fargate or in, in Azure with Azure Container Services, etc. But we choose to build our own container platform to facilitate all of the teams. So we have an MVP version ready. We had that ready somewhere halfway this year. And we looked upon, upon compliance. compliance. Um, compliance is making sure, make sure that you adhere to security standards and guidelines, being in control, knowing what runs where, under which conditions, and that we can yeah, verify and control the way things are being deployed and um, are exposed, for example, to the outside world or in the internal world. So we use a tool, an open source tool called Open Policy Agent for that. I have some slides about that, uh, how that works. And with that, we are moving forward. And in parallel with the container platform on EKS, we also need a platform on AKS, on Azure, Azure Container Services. So we started with that as well, uh, make it portable, and we can reuse a lot of stuff we previously created for the EKS part. We can use it on Azure as well, so we can also support the use cases, the applications that land on AWS. Uh, sorry, on Azure. So what happened after this? This is a whole journey. We see containers are being delivered everywhere. After we set up Jenkins in AWS, and when people start to build and run containers, they're storing their containers in a registry, and it accelerated a whole bunch of new initiatives. So there's so many more teams than just us as a very first, yeah, running, very first, had first team um, running containers. We see they, were, they are being delivered everywhere. So what did we do? It's a very complex topic because in the past we had the solutions department about software development initiatives and the run department, the infrastructure department, and that's like running the software. It's changing the bank versus running the bank, and that, yeah, that had to work in some way together. And containers can be seen somewhere in the middle. I mean, you can build them from the development perspective. We saw a lot of presentations uh, today also to integrate, for example, with Spring, Spring on Azure, for example. But on the other hand, you can also say like, hey, we're going to build Docker base images. We provide them for teams from the infrastructure um, level department. But with us, it's always, it's, it's somewhere in the middle. So we set up a container expert team and we called that team the Stratus team. And this is the phrase, it's low level clouds characterized by horizontal layering with a uniform base. And what we mean with that is we are, um, 
working together with the chief architects, the CISO departments, legal departments, um, on an architectural level, but also on a lower level, um, on the development team level, and also on the infrastructure level. So we see ourselves kind of in the middle of that, and that's why we choose this name and this, um, yeah, this beautiful picture of those clouds. So when I refer to the Stratus team, uh, I refer to the container expert team. So what is our mission? Our mission is to enable development teams to quickly deliver secure and high quality software by providing them easy to use platforms, for example, the container platforms, platform we're building, and also we provide them security, security guidelines, security standards, container security initiatives. And we do that to build reusable software components that we can use in every cloud provider, um, on every cloud platform. So this way we make sure applications are portable across different clouds, maybe even an on-prem data center where we can also run containers within a platform aspect. And this is very important because there's one big requirement for teams when they want to um, deploy their application on the cloud. And that is, for example, the exit strategy. You always have to have an alternative to where you are deploying to. So if you take the example from a container, you can move it around in different clouds without so much effort. Of course, there are still a whole bunch of aspects you need to take into account, but it's much more easier to deploy a container in different clouds or on-prem than, for example, when you're using pure cloud-native um, services, for example, AWS Lambda. How do you move that to another cloud? So that's a very important aspect here. If we look at the container platform components that are being created by, by the central team, the Stratus team, we can here see a total overview of all of the components on different levels. And here you see the meaning of the Stratus team, the, the cloud picture, remember working on the very high level with the architects to define all of this, but also on the infrastructure side, working together with the networking and storage team. So if we briefly go through the layers from bottom to top, you see we have an infrastructure layer, and for the infrastructure we choose for uh, AWS and for Azure as our cloud providers. About two years ago, those two cloud providers presented their cases, and we're um, utilizing whatever has been built in the past already. We're building on top of that. So we benefit from all of the features that the cloud provides us, and we are taking advantage of it to build something customized uh, on top of it to, in the end, support all the best benefits that we got. For provisioning, we use different flavors. We have here uh, Terraform. We also have CloudFormation. And for Azure, we're not for sure uh, what to use. Um, we have a Docker registry. We already got Nexus in our yeah, tools por portfolio. Development teams are aware of Nexus, they know how it works, and we also store Docker images in Nexus. We don't use Docker Hub, we are at a bank. Um, for the runtime layer, for persistent storage, that means applications and containers that should persist their storage. That means your storage should be um, kept intact when your container is being stopped or deleted. We haven't decided yet what to use. But for the runtime, we hooked up with, uh, with Docker as a standard um, <coughs> container runtime engine. A lot of developers are aware of that and they know how it works. So it was um, a good choice for us to, to start with that. For networking, we are uh, aiming for a CNI. We have not yet implemented it everywhere, but under the hood, it's already um, being used. So that we have for the runtime layer. Um, we choose only Kubernetes as the valid orchestrator for containers. There is some initiatives, some other initiatives like Swarm and Fargate and plain Docker containers on a standalone VM. But in the end, we aim to run every single workload, every single application that wants to use containers. We aim to run that based upon Kubernetes. And to actually deploy those applications from the development uh, layer, um, we use Helm and kubectl with a good preference, a big preference for Helm, to deploy um, applications, to package them, to create Helm charts. 
and we use uh, CloudBeast, Jenkins, and Azure DevOps to deploy those Helm charts and to, in the end, deploy the applications. Then there's a big pillar about um, security. Uh, for security and compliance, uh, for container security in this case, starting from the top, we use uh, TwistLock. Then we have secrets management with HashiCorp Vault. We have a POC running and it's now in production since a couple of weeks. And we're about to connect that to the container platform as well. I briefly touched upon OPA, uh, Open Policy Agent, for um, compliance. And then a very other, and another aspect which is very important is monitoring and logging. So we use Fluentd. There are some pucks running about Prometheus. And in the end, we push our logs to Splunk to be analyzed by teams and, for example, security operations teams. To make all of this happen, we need uh, pipelines. And a while ago, we already started to create standard pipelines for all components and for all different technology stacks. Um, we do that together with a specific pipeline team. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to quickly go over three over, over those slides because we already got some presentations about um, pipelines. But in essence, it's like we have standard pipelines for different stacks. This is an example of a Java pipeline that can do Maven, that can do JUnit, that can be built with uh, Gradle. And you see the different security stages, so in a cube, Fortify, <coughs> and a Nexus lifecycle. In the end, an application is good or not to go to uh, the next step, so it will be approved or not. The second pipeline we're using, which is important, is a Docker image pipeline. We can create Docker images with all of the required building blocks, and we can also extend that, uh, and we call it a Dockerized um, technology pipeline. For example, a Java application which will be Dockerized, it will be pushed through this pipeline, and it has twist lock in it, and also Nexus lifecycle to scan for vulnerabilities, for example. <coughs> in the end, the Dockerized application will be landing in uh, Nexus, our container registry, our Docker image registry. But the most important pipeline here is the cloud delivery pipeline. And this is a very simplify, simplified um, picture of how that works. So what we do is we push artifacts. It can be anything. We push that to S3. Uh, sometimes we store the raw data. Sometimes we store only the metadata. And then a code pipeline in AWS will be triggered automatically. And that will, in the end, trigger a deployment to deploy an application to uh, Amazon EKS and, in, in turn, our um, container platform. <clears throat> so if we combine all of those three pictures, you see the pipelines uh, are being combined, and then we have the full CI, CD yeah, um, workflow, to say it like that. Once we have those pipelines, it's easy to deploy applications. But there's a bunch of considerations that needs to be taken into account. Remember, we are a bank. We have critical applications that has a lot of uh, sensitive applications. Transactions, we have to detect money laundering, um, for example. And we're constantly being regulated by, for example, Dutch National Bank, all our auditors. They can be knocking on our door at every time. So we have to be in control. We have to be in control always. Not just one time a year or so, but always. You can always expect someone knocking on your door and checking your procedures, checking your security, checking your um, ways to protect your data and your applications. So security is a top priority, and it's a priority everywhere. So that means applications being developed within the bank or also applications acquired from vendors should be secure and compliant at all times. So that's why we have container security as a very important aspect here. If we, non -zoom, if we then zoom in into our container security solution, we choose TwistLog as a container security solution for vulnerability scanning and runtime protection. So at the top in purple, you see we have a TwistLog console running in AWS. It's also a container. It has policies and rules, and every workload and every container application or container component which is being used in AWS or in Azure on an, or in on-prem will be checked against those policies and rules. 
If we then zoom in into the Docker image pipeline, that's a very simplistic example of how we check a Docker image for uh, security uh, related issues. What you see is, is just a typical CI workflow. But what's important here is we have a smoke test, for example, and underneath you see twist lock scan. It means it's scanning that image to be built for vulnerabilities and for compliance. Um, and we put a threshold there. So it will report any vulnerabilities or compliance issues that are high or critical. We have not yet blocked anything. We first gather information because we don't know what's in there. But what I did is I analyzed a lot of Docker images which are being created the last couple of months. I also looked at Docker images coming from Docker Hub. I scanned them and made a report. And I think there was a talk on Tuesday or so uh, that the top 10 uh, Docker images has at least 30 vulnerabilities. I saw that it's true. So this is very important to detect security vulnerabilities or compliance related issues in a very early stage. We don't want to proceed with any Docker image, with any application ending up in Nexus that will just fill our repository. We want to stop the process of delivery very, very quick. That's like the shift security left, the shift left principle of container security in this case. And that also adheres to the principles for DevSecOps. Let's take a look at an example here. So this is the vulnerability scanning uh, stage in the Jenkins pipeline, in the Docker image pipeline. And here you can see there's a bunch of vulnerabilities, criticals in Java version 1.8 um, build 181. And that's a very common uh, version of Java being used. So it's very important to upgrade this and get rid of the vulnerabilities. So for these kind of um, problems, I call it problems, not a challenge because it's a problem. Um, we create base images. So the central, the, 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 the centralized uh, container expert team, they create Docker base images with Java, a patched version, and then other teams can use that. So then in the end, we fix it for, for all the teams. They don't have to do it themselves, and that creates a lot of extra time for them to focus on their applications. <coughs> Then we also have a Helm deployment pipeline. We're now shifting from the CI part to the CD part. Um, very simplified picture. We have a Helm chart. The Helm chart is being through, pushed through a Jenkins pipeline. And in the end, the Helm chart will be stored in an Amazon S3 bucket. It's storage on AWS. And that, in turn, triggers a code build pipeline. And that code build pipeline integrates with our um, EKS, our Kubernetes cluster. Um, so if we have that pipeline, we can extract two very valuable use cases out of that. The first one is the deployment of business applications by development teams. Development teams can package their application, create a Helm chart, refer to a Docker image, and deploy it on their cluster. But in this case, we're looking at um, the provisioning of resources which are required in every Kubernetes cluster that will be created within the bank. So we provide a centralized um, container platform or, or concepts for a container platform. It's like software components that can be reused by every team. It's very easy to spin up an EKS cluster yourself um, using a cloud formation template or um, for example, Terraform or click in the interface, all of that is not allowed within AB Numro. So what we do is a slightly different approach. Teams trigger a Lambda function, and that Lambda function, it's a serverless function in AWS, that Lambda function in turn triggers a standard cloud formation template, and that creates the cluster. Then you have a bare minimum cluster. You need to attach your worker nodes, your, your machines on which your containers are running in the end. But then you have an empty cluster. You only have the required components from the perspective of the cloud provider. You can do anything with that, with that cluster. And we consider those kind of clusters, we consider them as incompliant because we, as the central team, we 
create resources and we deploy them on top of that cluster for every cluster that will be created by a development team. I take some examples of what we provision, pre-provision for uh, every team. We have, for example, monitoring and logging. We, create a, we created a Kubernetes operator that interacts with the cluster um, when teams, for example, deploy their applications. And we provision a twist log defender to protect their workloads on a runtime level. There's a lot more. You saw all those components uh, like building blocks in the container platform diagram. But we zoom, on, we zoom in for those three aspects um, because those are very, very important and they are really practical examples. It's also worth mentioning here that we control how RBAC is being configured in every cluster. So by default, if you create a cluster in AWS, the, the person who creates that cluster is the owner and the admin of the cluster. With us, that's not allowed, because then you can do anything that's not, well, making the cluster compliant, and it can, yeah, do a, you, you can do a lot of stuff which in the end um, creates vulnerabilities or creates risks um, for the bank. So we control how RBAC is being configured. And in essence, we are kind of the admins here. We don't do all of this manually. It's all about um, pipelines and automatic tasks. And we give developers, for example, only rights in their own namespace. There they got their full rights, so they can do their what they need. And also they can create their own custom namespaces. But they can't see these uh, required resources. They, can't, they don't have access to the namespaces where these components are being deployed in. So, for example, they can't switch off a Twistlock Defender, so they always have container runtime security being operational, and otherwise there should be a very big alert. <coughs> if we then zoom in into um, the centralized logging feature, we use container um, insights for logging mechanisms, we send those logs to, to CloudWatch, so teams can log on to their AWS console and they can view their logs from their containers um, in a centralized way. And why I touched upon this topic is Container Insights is just being released, I think, in September, something like that. And people still think it's a bank. They are slow. They create legacy. They have lots of procedures, controls, and it takes a very long time to deliver something especially if it's about innovation, containers, or security, or whatever. This proves we are using it. It's almost, yeah, one and a half month old. So we consider us as, yeah, being on the, on the, fr the, the front runners for these kind of new technologies. So that's also a reason why I showed this. And then we have the monitoring of clusters. It's very important to keep track of a lot of clusters. Every team gets its own AWS account for segregation reasons and for simplicity. <clears throat> and also they get their own EKS cluster. It's not one big cluster for all applications or all the teams. Here you see the monitoring of two clusters. So there's a shared cluster that's with us. Uh, we use that for um, testing out components. And there's a cluster from one of my colleagues called Mike. Uh, he created his own cluster to also test and deploy some stuff. And there's some load tests going on, there's some peak in memory usage, so we also use that to, to benchmark our clusters to see uh, how they perform. <coughs> so every team will have its own cluster, and they're not an admin on their cluster, as I said before. But what they can do is they can create separate namespaces. For example, they have application A and application B, they don't want to put them all in one namespace. It's better to segregate it so we can also define rules and policies based upon individual namespaces, for example. So we created a Kubernetes operator, and that Kubernetes operator hooks in whenever there's something being created or changed within the cluster. So our first use case was to facilitate teams with um, multiple namespaces, but we don't know those namespaces up front. It can be any namespace. 
we don't pre-provision namespaces like namespace 1, namespace 2, namespace 3. Teams should be able to create it themselves. But those namespaces should be monitored. They should have, um, for example, a um, security token, a Docker registry secret being stored as a Kubernetes secret in every namespace. Otherwise, it's impossible to pull images from our Docker internal registry. So what's being done right here? We have a developer on the left and it creates a namespace using kubectl or a pipeline, it doesn't matter for us. Then an event is being triggered and sent to the Kubernetes operator. The Kubernetes operator in turn fetches a secret from a specific place in AWS <coughs> and it stores that secret as a Kubernetes secret in the namespace um, that has been created by the developer. And from that moment in time, uh, a developer can deploy his application because then there is a secret to pull the Docker image from a registry. Otherwise, it's impossible for them to deploy what they need. If they don't have that secret, they're unable to pull an image uh, from the registry. And this rule is not active yet, but we are moving forwards toward this. This is a rule from Twistlock. It's a runtime protection rule. And we state only whitelisted images which have been pushed through the Docker image pipeline or the Dockerized uh, application pipeline. Only those images that pass all of the security tests and all of the compliance tests, only those images are allowed. So in the end, we can switch off um, the connection to Docker Hub. And with the pre-provisioning of the secret, we make sure that teams can actually do this without knowing that secret. So that also helps them to, yeah, to, to keep the maintenance of those clusters to a minimum. Because if we change that secret, it will change for all the teams and they don't have to configure that every time again. <clears throat> we call this the, the, the first build breaker. Most probably it will be the first rule that will actually block any deployment which does not adhere to um, this rule. <clears throat> Here you see um, a snapshot of all the rules that we have in Twistlock. We're gathering information, so everything is being set to alert. But if we put this rule into action for all the hosts, Right now, at the very right, on the third item under the topic Add Resources, you see it's only one host. If we leave that out and put an asterisk there, then every host will be protected using this rule. Then, if we move to compliance, so we talked about security. Security is one aspect of compliance, but there's also principles more in general that apply for compliance. So how do we make sure we adhere to the compliance controls we set? So we work very closely together with the um, chief architect, with the CISO department, security operations department, uh, risk management department, uh, business continuity department, etc. And we use these compliance controls to, to roll out this platform and with every decision we take, um, we evaluate these rules and we evaluate these controls to see if we are, yeah, if we are fitting in with these um, yeah, theoretical controls. So we use a trust but verify approach. We trust a lot about developers, but we also verify that they are still being compliant. I showed you an example earlier, for example, the Docker image um, being pulled from Nexus. <coughs> So for that, we need to have compliance as code. All of the rules should be written out in code, being put in version control, being having a life cycle, and we integrate the policy engine in Kubernetes. I'll show you an example a little bit later on. We have monitoring and alerting. It's compliance-related logs. Those are sent to CloudWatch and pushed to, to Splunk to be analyzed. And whenever there, whenever there is something happening which is not allowed, a security operations team is being notified and that in turn contacts the team to fix it. So there is a timely mitigation. Uh, things need to be fixed in time. 
if you're using an AMI, that's like a Docker, uh, sorry, a virtual machine image in uh, Amazon, if you're not patching it, and if you're three versions behind, we consider that as being incompliant, and that will be blocked. Your VM will stop working. We also use sys benchmarking. We use sys hardening for those AMIs. That's why we use custom AMIs based upon standard AMIs for, in this case, from, uh, from Amazon. Um, we're also moving to AKS, and there's a different situation. Um, Microsoft provides those virtual machines. You can't access them. They say they do sys benchmarking, but we don't know what's in there. So there's another um, challenge. Then everything should be versioned. It's all about immutability and traceability. Well, the default software source code uh, rules apply here that, that, that are for software development uh, components. They also apply for those policies. If we then look at our strategy on how we um, implement compliance within the container platform, we use open policy agent uh, called OPA. Um, for all of those compliancy rules, it's a very generic tool. It's an open source tool, and we can use it for different um, components. We use it to define and enforce policies for compliance, and we split the definition of the policies and the enforcement of the policies. And in this case, we have some examples. I'll show you one of them. Uh, and we use it as a Kubernetes admission controller. And that means it checks everything that's being done within the cluster. It checks for rules and it stops, uh, for example, an application or a deployment from being created when there's something wrong that, that violates a policy. If we then take into example the, the, the policy enforcement, you see on the top it's the cloud platform team and the compliance officers both define the compliance rules so we do that together with the compliance officers. It's a functional and a technical aspect that needs to come together. And you can use um, compliance as code in your Docker pipeline, your Docker image pipeline, in the Terraform pipeline, in the Helm pipeline. Uh, we've done some work on the Terraform pipeline, not yet for the Docker image pipeline, not yet for the Helm pipeline, but we're already using it um, on a very small scale yet, but we do use it as a cluster policy in EKS, and the same policies we can also use for AKS. And then it's very good to know what can those policies be. So we have created a first set of policies to prevent risks in a very early stage. For example, if we create a bucket, there's a lot of buckets, there's a lot of storage in AWS that we use, that bucket, that storage device, that storage option should be encrypted. If it's not encrypted, it's incompliant, you will get a warning, and in the end your, your storage will be gone, it will be deleted. It's also very important to rotate keys. If your keys are not being rotated, you always have the same key, and if that key is being compromised, we are at risk. So keys should be rotated. The example we're going to look at here is um, preventing internet-facing load balancers. So whenever you do deploy an application that needs to be accessible by another team or your team from your laptop, for example, not within the cluster itself, not within the Kubernetes cluster itself, you should have a load balancer. And that load balancer is not allowed to be internet-facing. So if I create a deployment here, if I deploy my application, I will not be able to access it from the internet. But if that do happens, we need to stop that. So by default, that's not allowed. So here we have the example of the um, prevention of internet-facing load balancers. You see here that, <coughs> sorry, that code snippet, and that code snippet is a, a policy in OPA. It's in the language called um, Rego, and that's a very generic language, but a bit Specific in some cases, you need to learn that. Um, and here you see there's the block, the, the input block. Here you see there is an ALB, an application load balancer. It uses a scheme, and that scheme is pointed to, is, it has the value internet facing. That means anyone can access that from the internet. That, what I said, is not allowed. So it goes through the OPA rules 
Whenever you create it, it goes through the OPA rules. It's interacting with the Kube API server. It's like the main component of any Kubernetes cluster. And it evaluates the package. It evaluates the input. And then it comes back with an output. And here it says compliance check failed. We have a special code for that, ELB0 um, underscore 15. And it said, this is not allowed. You can't really see the error message, but um, it's there in the real world how we use it. Um, so this way we make sure that we, are in, that we are compliant in this case and that we prevent developers from deploying applications which uh, do not adhere to the um, compliance rules. It's just a very simple example. There will be more, but this is just a start for us. <clears throat> so what are our next steps? I mean, I can talk about this for way more time. There's so much more components, but I'd like to wrap this up because we have a session of uh, 50 minutes. So then we also have some time for question and answers maybe. And our next steps will be, we're about to roll this out we're now in the development and the test uh, environments, and we want to roll this out through production so teams can actually use that for their uh, applications. We have onboarded almost like 10 teams right now, and it's gradually um, growing. Um, for that, we also need to extend our compliance efforts because this was just one of the first rules, but there will be many more rules that we need to, to implement. Also, we need to support workloads on, on Azure, on AKS, the Azure Kubernetes service. And we are now utilizing whatever we already created for the EKS, the, the, the cluster on AWS. We are utilizing that for um, AKS. And with all of these efforts, we in the end support the new strategy of ABNMRO. And the new strategy is all about moving towards DevOps, DevSecOps. So with this, we support the journey. And yeah, I hope this talk was inspiring you. I hope you saw we do a lot of things that we consider as being innovative. And we try to make that happen within the bank in, an, uh, yeah, in a timely fashion. So thank you all for, uh, for joining and thank you for listening. This is it. <clears throat> Any questions? Yep, yeah, there in the middle. Um, why do you use the open policy agents and not the AWS policies when you can control the same thing? So the question is why do you use OPA policies instead of the built in AWS policies, right? So we use OPA because we want to also use it for different aspects, not just in AWS. For example, also in AKS. And maybe we also want to use OPA in, for example, the Docker image pipeline to check, um, for example, to enforce standards and guidelines, for example, naming conventions on Docker images. That's why we separated it from uh, a cloud native solution um, that you state about AWS. There's a question there. So the question is, we also use um, Azure DevOps, and why do, did we choose to have a vendor lock in there and not on the, on the AWS side, right? On the Jenkins side. Yeah, with Jenkins, we also have a kind of a vendor lock. We have a commercial version. It has their own language. Um, but to answer your question, we just moved to that. There's workloads on uh, Azure that needs to be pushed through that use very specific functions or special features from Azure. And for that, we best use uh, Azure DevOps. And also, there's a big movement now for a lot of other workloads. So we're experimenting to see how we can use that. Um, so we use that alongside what we have right now. Indeed, there's yeah some kind of a vendor lock-in, but yeah, there's always different aspects. What we try to do is with the, with the components picture of all of the components of the platform. We try to make it as independent, as loosely coupled as possible. So if there's one solution that does not fit in anymore, or if we want to replace that, we are able to replace it. 
I hope this answered your question. Uh, I think that person was first. Yeah, it's two. It's about six per team. It's uh, the question was you mentioned two teams, the centralized container team, the Stratus team, and the pipeline team, and uh, it's about six in every team. But we work closely together. There was another question. <coughs> you, you mentioned you manage the base images. Uh, how do you manage rolling out new base images? So what we do, we created a first set of base images. The question is, how do we manage that? So we publish them to Nexus, and for now, we just make a list of base images that we created, and we have a concept called communities, and we have um, Teams, Microsoft Teams, but also Slack for communication. If we push out new images, we notify Teams using that, and they can look it up in, the, in some wiki pages as well. So it's not completely automated, but yeah, it's a base. It's a base for base images. <clears throat> Any other questions there? You were the first, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, so you mentioned that you have a total of about uh, 12 people working on this. How many years or months have you been spending time on this? <clears throat> yeah, it's, um, the question is you, how, how much time did you work on this? Taken into account the two teams, so that's a total of 12 teams. But that's not the total number of teams working on this. So the container team, I'm one of those, those members for that team, that's about six. Then we have the pipeline team, that's also about six. Then we have, for example, um, the AWS teams, they helped us a lot. That's, I think, like six architects or so, it's all, always about six, but also a lot of other people uh, supporting. Chief architects, we are involved with two or three main of them. Um, we have an operations team, for example, uh, maintaining um, the infrastructure for, for Twistlock and also for Jenkins. That's also about six. So in total, maybe 50, team, 50, sorry, 50 persons involved, but we are like the core, the six people. And we started about one year ago. Does that answer your question? It's difficult to say, but that's a rough calculation. <clears throat> There's another question from your neighbor. So the question is, do we have plans to migrate everything to this platform? It differs a bit. Um, we don't push it very hard. There's still a lot of legacy. Teams in the end can choose whether or not moving to the cloud. It really depends on how mature their applications are. So for example, we're not lifting and shifting monoliths. We have a preset of requirements that we stated, which need to be taken into account for the development teams and for their applications before they can move to our platform. But we welcome everyone that is yeah, enthusiastic, that has their application um, being split into microservices, for example, uh, that have it secured. We don't want application that has a lot of critical vulnerabilities. It will put us at risk, and in the end, it will put the bank at risk. Um, and also, we welcome teams that have knowledge about containers, and if they have knowledge about AWS or Azure, and also about uh, Kubernetes. Yeah, that's the most ideal team, of course. But we welcome everyone that is ready. There's another question. <clears throat> so if I got the question correct, what is the ratio about applications which are ready to land here compared to applications which are not ready, right? I think it's about 3,000 applications that we have in total, maybe more, maybe less. That number, yeah, uh, changes, uh, changes over time. Um, so we have like 10 applications that are now, yeah, slowly being deployed. But there's also a lot of initiatives that might come to us. So yeah, it's, it's a very small percentage yet, but we have plans to move a lot more. And that's coming from the top management. So if this is in production, if we build this, and if we extend this, and if it, we make it even more easier, for example, for teams, yeah, that can be a big load coming when this is ready. For now, we, uh, we try to be very uh, careful because, yeah, we're just with six people, 
and we don't want to run into um, yeah buffer overflows, human buffer overflows, to say it like that. It's another question there. So the question is, how did you convince compliance to the cloud? Um, that is a very long story. For every application, you need to go through a very long list of um, questions, um, interviews, committees. I can give you the example for Jenkins, one of the first applications to move to the cloud. Um, that's a critical application because it's a centralized CI tool, right? So every team depends on it. So we created a business case, and we created everything that was needed to convince everyone on every department that has a say on it. So the answer is very difficult to answer. Uh, the, the question is very difficult to answer. But as we got invited to move to the cloud, when the cloud teams um, provided this to us, they also risk assessed all of the services, the standard cloud native services that we can utilize, and that took quite a while but now the most important services are ready. So we can now utilize the standard controls, the advanced controls, and yeah, the, the kind of super advanced controls for the most sensitive workloads. It's now being standardized, so that makes it more easy to move along and have the compliance officers uh, with us. That's, that's basically how it goes. And now it's less difficult than two years back, for, two years back, for example. But still, it's a, it's a challenge. I think that's the last question. Time is also up. So thank you again. <clears throat>